Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. <laughs> My husband was shushing me up over there because I was listening to that music. Of the youth. Was that great, the youth? Was that great? I was listening to that music. I'm going to Jess. Is that worship 2025? I mean, I can see it now. Here I am, 85 years old, going. I mean, worship is changing all the time. My, uh, you know, we're doing a parenting series, and um, I'm going to be sharing our family tonight and some things that happened. And, and uh, I just want to tell you a little story. Um, yesterday, I babysat some of my grandkids and uh, for the youth conference because Jess and Dan were actually here and, and so um, I had Micah and Chloe and Ty Ty and they were at my house and my house is completely torn up right now. It's actually not my house, it's your house. <laughs> we're living in a church house and we're getting it ready to sell and so I mean wallpaper's being stripped and I'm living in a construction zone and so everything's tore up. And uh, one of my grandkids, I won't tell you which one, but one of them was just, you know, I'd given him two ice cream cones. We'd watched Frozen, <laughs> the new movie. Then we had a couple of candy bars. <laughs> so they were a little wound up, mom and dad, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so payback, isn't it, you know, when you're grandparents? And, um, and so one of, the, one of my grandkids, he, uh, he got really, you know, just a little spun out and he uh, accidentally broke a lamp and, uh, he was crying and crying, and I just came out and I said, oh, I hated that lamp. That was a horrible lamp. I'm really glad you broke it. Don't cry, it's okay. And I was comforting him, and I was thinking, what a difference between being a parent, which I'd have knocked him out, and being a grandparent where I'm comforting him and saying, oh, it's okay, man, I'll get another one. Don't worry about it. I mean, there is a big stretch between being a parent where you would not give them two ice cream cones and some candy bars and buy Frozen on television because it's ridiculous and you couldn't afford it. And being a grandparent where things have really changed and your perspective is completely different. And so tonight I'm going to be bringing you part two of, of some things that happened in our family and what God did for us and how he showed us what to do. And I am not bringing it from a perspective of a parent. I'll be bringing it from, you know, much older now, looking back. And so, God willing, I believe that it will give you some tips and some tools. You know, we've got a tool belt in life, and there's some things God wants us to put inside and just pull out and use. And it's just good tips and good, good wisdom from God, from his word. And I hope that's my heart tonight, that I'll be able to give you some things that worked for us and pass it on to you. You know, parenting doesn't come with a manual. It comes with the Word of God, and each child is different. And so will you stand with me, and let's go before the Lord, and let's um, open the Word of God tonight and see what God would have me to share with you. And I trust it will be a blessing, and it will help you. So, Father, thank you for the incredible privilege of standing before a congregation and being able to give testimony of your faithfulness and your goodness. And Lord, I thank you for your word tonight, which has the power to bring itself to pass, that no word of yours returns void, but it accomplishes that which you send it to do. And I pray tonight, Father, that your word would go forth in the heart of each and every hearer of this message, that you would strengthen your house and strengthen your church, strengthen your parents. May they be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. May they have savvy in this 21st century, Lord, and understand what the will of the Lord is for them and for their house, for their children. And may they have great confidence, Lord, knowing that you watch over them and that you are the God that is able to take what is impossible with man and you are able to bring it into your kingdom and change it and rearrange it and you can take any broken family and your love can fix anything. So I thank you, Father, for the word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And I suppose if I could title this message, I would title it, Your Love Can Fix Anything, but I've titled it actually something different, Raising a Generation of God's Heroes, Part 2. What I wanted to do tonight is I wanted to just share with you some things that happened in our family. And when Jim and I got married, and you know our testimony, we just came off of a marriage series. 
we weren't planning on being pastors. We were planning on being business people. Jim was in construction, and he was in, in uh, he had an insurance agency. I mean, the man had done anything. He could sell oil to Arabs and ice cubes to Eskimos. He has an incredible gift to, to convince people. And um, we did not know that God was going to use that ex exhortation gift that he has on his life to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. We did not start out as pastors. We started out as two broken people coming from uh, broken marriages. He had a daughter, I had a daughter, coming together in 1979 and bringing a blended family together. Not aware at that moment in time when we stood before our pastor and said the I do's that we would ever be launched into a life that we have lived these last 35 years. So I'm here to tell you that God can use anyone and his love can fix anything. And it is the will of God to mend and restore broken families and broken relationships. That is God's will. So if you're in a family situation right now that is not 100% wonderful, then you, you're in a situation and you're here tonight and I've got good news for you because it's God's will that he heal your family and that he mend your family. It's God's will to restore broken relationships and to reconcile families and children and moms and dads and to do these things. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't recognize divorce because he does. And I know you don't hear this very often from a church pulpit, but I came out of a divorce and so did my husband. God does recognize divorce. He doesn't want it. He hates it. But if you are divorced, there is life after divorce and there is a new life for you and you can move on. So every situation is different, but I want you to know that. But last week I started out in Psalm 127, and I'm just going to pull it up on the overhead. And it's a song of a sense of Solomon, and it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. And we started off last week, and we saw that children are a reward and an inheritance. That God has a lot to say about gates. He has a lot to say about the enemy. And I, I went back into Genesis and we saw that there was a war going on. That God's original intent, his divine plan for mankind was not that we would raise our children in sorrow and hard work. And not that man would work by the sweat of his brow. And that he would, he would work so hard that thorns and thistles and all these things would come up. That was a result of the fall of disobedience. Sin entered this world and the definition of sin is lawlessness. And you'll find that in John, 1 John chapter 3. Sin entered this world and the God of this world, Satan, usurped the authority from Adam and Eve and he took dominion over this planet. Jesus called him the God of this world. He's an under ruler. He's a renegade serpent. He is vehemently against all that God stands for. And make no mistake, he is vehemently against you and me. He is not your friend. There is no truth in him. He is a deceiver and a liar from the very beginning. And God spoke in Genesis chapter 3 after he was bringing forth the consequence of the fall. And he said to Eve, in pain and sorrow, hard work, you're going to raise a family. And your desire is going to be for your husband and he's going to rule over you. And then he looked at Adam and he said, Adam, this earth is now cursed because of you. And where before it would have agreed with you and been in harmony with you, now it's going to be hard work, Adam. Everything you try to do, every dream you try to dream, everything that happens to you, you're going to have to do it by the sweat of your brow because of what you've done. Because now everything has changed and there was a broken relationship. First man with God was broken. Then man with himself was broken. Then man with each other was broken. Relationships were broken. And we were actually broken off with creation. And it says in Romans chapter 8 that creation is groaning and moaning for the sons of God to be revealed. Because there is a day coming when all things will be put back together. There is a day coming. Listen to me, church. There's a day coming when the lion is going to lay down with the lamb. When the bear and the ox are going to eat. Hey. 
stay together and straw together when everything that is dysfunctional right now will all be put back into godly order. It is coming and we live for that day. But right now we are in this earth and on this earth and we are in a war. And don't think there's not a war over your children because there is. And God wants us to understand and be smart. He said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In other words, I've taken you out of the kingdom of darkness and I brought you into the kingdom of God when you got born of the spirit of God. But that doesn't mean that everything's going to be hunky-dory. It just means that now you've got the kingdom of God at your disposal. And like Dan preached this morning, the blood of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus and all the authority that he has now taken back from the enemy now we are actually not wrestling with flesh and blood although the bible says that we are we are wrestling with it but we are now enforcing the victory that jesus christ has already gained for you and i at that cross and resurrection so i don't have to beg god to help me i just have to know what god has already given me through jesus christ and begin to be a warrior in the kingdom of God and a godly mother and a godly husband so that we can take these kids and raise them the right way. So when the enemy comes after them, and he will, he is not going to gain a victory in their life. And if your kids right now are far from God and if they are suffering right now in sin and they're in deception right now, I can tell you this, they are working on their testimony. It's not over yet. It's not finished yet. The end hasn't happened yet. And you cannot see today what they're going to be like tomorrow unless you see with the eyes of faith and you see what God says about your children. Because there are no perfect families, but there is a perfect God. And he loves our children. And he wants our children saved. So having said that, I looked at six things that God had given Jim and I as a mom learning how to be a godly woman and learning how to be a godly mother that he, he gave us over these years to parent our children. And I told you last week that the Cobray family, listen, we're mess-ups. We were mess-ups from the beginning. My husband was divorced three times and married three times. He married everybody. I just lived with everybody. We were screw-ups. But we're not screw-ups anymore because God changes us. He rearranges our thinking and he changes us and gives us the power to live for him from the inside out. But that doesn't mean we're perfect parents. We messed up. We did things we shouldn't have done. But God's bigger than our mistakes. So again, I'm going to tell you these things and I'm going to be as honest with you as I can. And I'm going to share with you what happened. So we brought a blended family together. Jim had a daughter, Kimberly Cobray, and she was five years old when we got married. And I had a daughter, Miranda. She was nine. And Miranda, from the day that we got married, Miranda called Jim dad. She didn't have a father. She had a real father, but he had not been active in her life. He'd been in and out of her life. And so she needed a dad, and she wanted a dad. And the first thing she did, and we didn't ask her to do it, we didn't coach her to do it, it was just the day we got married, Miranda started calling Jim dad. But with Kimberly, she had a mom. And she came and visited us, and she was coming from a completely different household. Miranda lived with us, Kimberly visited us. So there was a whole different set of circumstances. And there were times, and Kim's here on the front row tonight, and so I think I've got permission from Kim to share some, some intimate things with you. There were times when I was the evil stepmother. Do I have any evil stepmothers in here tonight? <laughs> it's okay, because we're going to look, and maybe we'll have a panel later on in this parenting series, because how many of you have, are bringing blended families together? Let me see your hands. Yeah, there's, I mean, that's pretty much the norm in our generation now is to bring blended families. If you're not a blended family, you are not the norm, and praise God you're not, but that doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect family. So I, I talked about number one was my first point. I didn't get off of it, the power of unity. Make a plan and work a plan, and you'll have to get the CD for that. But, you know, kids learn and kids grow from what you are, not what you say. You know, if I had a disease or a, a horrible disease called anthrax, which is deadly, if I had anthrax and I told you I had a bad cold and you were in my presence and anthrax is extremely communicable, it's very dangerous, would you catch anthrax or would you catch a cold? You'd catch anthrax. 
I've told you I had a cold, but I really had anthrax. What would you catch? Anthrax, right? You're going to catch what you have. And that's really what the, the essence of last week was, is that children aren't stupid. They're going to catch what we have. And what we are is what they're going to be. And if I tell my kids, don't drink, but I drink, they're going to see what I do, not what I say. And so last week it was make a plan, work a plan, be a united front, live in front of your kids like you want them to grow up to be. And number two, so there's going to be six things. I'm going to give you the, the last of the four of them this, tonight. And number two, so let's look at point number two. Be honest as a family. Honesty. What a thought, honesty. We live in a world of deception and intrigue and lies. Jesus said that the, the devil, Satan himself, in John the 8th, the 10th chapter, Jesus said that the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. So there was the mission statement of Jesus to give you life and give it abundantly, and there was the mission statement of Satan, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So the enemy, and Jesus said in John the 8th chapter, when he was describing Satan, he said that he is a deceiver, and that there is no truth in him, and that he was a liar from the beginning. So the very essence of God is truth. When Pilate looked at Jesus and Jesus began to share with him and the few words that he spoke to Pilate, he said, I have come to live the truth, to verify the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? And we live in a generation where truth is subjective. It's whatever you think it is. But you see, God is the God of truth. God is the God that shines the light in the darkness. And when families hide things and they have secrets, then what happens is you have just put your family in the shadows of darkness and now that darkness has power over that lie that you're spinning. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jim and I were talking about it on the way to church and I'm a kingdom girl. God has given me a, a revelation of the kingdom of heaven in my own personal life. I teach it in the Bible college. When I got born of the spirit of God, there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness and there is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It says that I got translated out of darkness and I was put into God's kingdom. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, fear not little flock. It is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This kingdom has a king. And this kingdom operates on godly principles and laws. Are you with me? Therefore, God says to me, you cannot access the supernatural kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the things that you need in the invisible realm that are yours and available to you. You cannot access them with the arm of the flesh. You cannot be in the flesh and expect God to bring forth that which is for you in the spirit. It will not work because the spirit and the flesh are at enmity with each other and they war against each other. Are you with me? Therefore, when I'm going to start a foundation in my family based on lies and deception, it's not going to access that which God has for my family. It's going to give power to darkness. And the more deception there is in a family, the more you try to hide, the more you try to pull things back, the more the enemy has the power to cast the shadows of darkness over that family. And I love what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, he says, you know, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. What a thought. When you tell the truth, you do not have to remember what you said. Because when you start spinning deception and you start hiding things, then all of a sudden you are now protecting something and hoping it's not going to come out and your kids are going to find out another way. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So Jim and I knew from the very beginning we lived in a fishbowl and we better keep it clean and we better be honest and transparent so what you see is what you get at the Cobra house and we were honest. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25 says, Therefore, put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor. 
for we are members of one another. Secrets make problems bigger than they are. Secrets make problems bigger than they are. And I realize there's a whole plethora of things in families from adoptions to this isn't your real father, this isn't your real mother, all of these things. And I'm not telling you what to do, but I am telling you that God is a God of honesty and he exposes families from the Bible. He never hid people. He shared with us what they did and who they were. He did not hide David and Bathsheba's sin. He did not hide those things that are teaching lessons for you and I today. So it takes a lot of courage to fess up to where you've come from and what's happened. But I have found, and Jim has found, and we started our marriage in honesty. We didn't hide things from our children. We, they knew the truth about us. They knew the truth about our past. And as they grew up and they were old enough to understand, they knew that we loved them. They knew that God could fix anything. And it didn't matter whose they were, who they belonged to. What mattered is they belonged to us and they belonged to God. And therefore, we were a family. So some things to think about in honesty. Sometimes you're going to have to go to bed on some things because they're just not as big as they are right now. They're smaller the next day. When problems come and you don't know what to do. In honesty, and being honest, you're going to have to die to having any, any reputation to maintain or to create. In other words, your kids and your life sometimes is just going to embarrass you. So just get used to it. We had to realize that we don't have a reputation that we have to maintain or a reputation that we have to create. Like I said, we lived in front of people. That means right now, just like you were checking me out, what I'm wearing, what I'm saying, I'm an open book right now. I understand that spotlight. Do I like it? Not necessarily. Does my flesh want to crawl back into the shadows? Oh yeah, do I want you to think certain things of me? Oh, I would love for you to. But you see, that's not real. Because you can't fool God and you can't hide from God. And God has called his people to walk in the light and to be the light. Therefore, you cannot live in shadows of deception and darkness because it won't access the light that you're going to need to heal this family that may be screwed up. So sometimes you're going to have to just die to any kind of reputation. When our kids were screwing up, I mean, we've had daughters pregnant. We've had abortions. We've had divorces. We have had quite a mess in our family going through raising up our children. Yes, the pastors. There were times when Jim and I looked at each other and we said we should resign the ministry. But you see, we were honest with our church. And our church, and you know, you're a different church now. Back 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when Kim got pregnant out of wedlock, she wasn't married. She'd just come back to God. She was beautiful and I'll give you a testimony in just a minute about Kim and she was pregnant carrying this child we didn't know what to do should we resign because Kim made a mistake or should we just be honest with the church and I remember the day we went before the church and said our daughter Kim who's come back to us who walked that aisle and got saved because she was a meth addict and one day she walked that aisle at the Rock Church in another building and she got saved gloriously saved and changed forever and this child that's going to be 40 years old is one of the most amazing women on the planet that I've ever had the privilege to know or meet but you see your kids are going to screw up and that's where honesty comes in. And guilt is absolutely a wasted emotion. It does no good. I would feel so guilty when my kids would screw up. And one day God spoke to me and he said, was I not a perfect parent? And I said, yes, you were, sir. He said, did I not give my children a perfect life? Speaking of Adam and Eve, and I said, yes, you did. He said, did they not have a perfect atmosphere? Was everything not perfect for them? And I said, yes, it was. And he said, but yet they still had to choose and they had to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or not eat from it. They had to choose their own life and their own tree. So will your children, because your children choose wrong, does not, does not mean that you are not a good parent. It means that your children have free will and they have to make choices. So guilt is absolutely a wasted emotion. So sometimes you're going to have to just go to bed and just realize you're not going to fix it tonight. It's not going to happen. You're honest, you're open, but you're going to have to just go to bed and trust God. You're going to have to die to having any reputation because sometimes these kids are going to embarrass you. 
with their choices. And you're going to think, oh, God, why did they do that? Or break your heart. But that's part of raising children. That's why God looked at Eve and he said, in sorrow, you're going to bring forth children. He wasn't just talking about having a baby and it's going to hurt. He was talking about the sin nature that is now in every child born of the flesh. And that sin nature is going to break your heart. But you're going to have to learn how to walk in the kingdom of God and overcome it. And God can fix it. And God can change things. But it doesn't mean you're not going to like what happens with your reputation. So look at your neighbor and say, well, the reputation's shot. (laughs) It's not a bad thing. Because we don't have any reputation to maintain or create anyway except the one of Jesus Christ. We're going to have to learn as honest as a family to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Those are powerful words. When you can apologize as a family, you've now stepped into healing. You are not always going to do things the right way. You are going to discipline what you shouldn't have, say what you shouldn't have said, maybe actions that you shouldn't have had. And if you will be big enough, and men, I can say this, when when men apologize to their children and to their wives, something powerful happens in a family. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength and courage. And God's power, power, power is packed when you can say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. And like we had... We had a wonderful pastor from the Ukraine here about three weeks ago, and he said, forgive, forget, move on. Forgive, forget, move on. But it's hard to forgive in a family when we're not honest and we can't admit to mistakes. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. So honesty in a family, learning how to say I'm sorry. Guilt is a wasted emotion. Not everything is your fault. Not everything is going to be your fault. God had perfect kids and they still messed up. So get rid of the guilt. It's only going to give you condemnation. It doesn't change anything. But let's, let's walk on in faith. Number three. So number two was be honest as a family. Number three, pray. Listen, I probably was the prayer warrior in our family. My husband stood over our family and covered our family as a man of God. But men and women do pray differently. There is no doubt about it. And for some reason... God got in my spirit about the power of a certain kind of prayer and intercession. And I was a young mom, and I didn't want to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and feed my children, but I had to. I was nursing them. We lived in Lake Arrowhead. I was freezing 2 o'clock in the morning. And I remember complaining to God one night about being up because my kids never slept through the night when they were little. And God said, why don't you just use this time as an opportunity to spend with me and become an intercessor for your family? And there God began to teach me about praying. And I would bring my Bible with me. I would have a flashlight. I'd have a blanket over my head because I was freezing. Once I put the baby to bed and I couldn't sleep, then I'd begin to just take that flashlight and my word, and I would begin to pray. And God would begin to give me the word. He'd begin to say, Tell, turn to this scripture and turn to that scripture. And I can remember... Having God give me promises that were so far-fetched that it was like, God, these are just little kids. This can't be for them. I thought it was for the church. I had no idea that God was giving me a promise when my children were little that I was going to need to hang on to when they were teenagers and young men and women. I didn't know then when they were perfect little beings and I couldn't imagine them ever doing anything wrong. I have anybody in here like that right now? Then all of a sudden they go to junior high and it's like, where did our children go? But God had given me the promise before there was ever a problem. And the promise that God gave me that I'll never forget was Jeremiah 31, 16, and 17. And it said, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, says the Lord. For there's hope in your future. Your work will be rewarded. Your children shall return from the enemy's land and they will come again into their own borders. And I didn't know that that word from the prophet Jeremiah when I was gosh, about 32 years old, praying in Lake Arrowhead, freezing my head, you know, freezing my body, my, my, my blanket over me and my flashlight and my Bible. I had no idea that word was going to carry me and carry our children through the, the, the vintages of hell that wanted to come against them and pull them out of the kingdom of God. But the promises of God are strong. And one day I was crying and I was praying and, and God said, oh, will you stop it? And I said, what do you mean? I said, my children are, 
are not serving you right now and things are horrible and I was just crying and I was at a broken heart. And he says, will you stop it? And I said, what do you mean? He says, you're praying. He says, and you got this butter knife out. He says, you, your, your sword of the spirit, the word of God that you're supposed to be praying is going to slice through, but you've got nothing but a butter knife in your hand right now, child. Will you stop it and get out your sword? And God began to show me that there was fervent, focused, faith-filled, word-based prayer that you stand in the gap in the name of Jesus and you pull out the sword of the spirit, which is prayer, and you begin to pray and you begin to do things that God's told you to do. And you have to decree it and declare such a thing. Because as he is in this earth, so are we. So you can go to God with a butter knife whining and crying and telling God how sorry you are and this should have never happened. Or you can get over it and you can step back and you can get the promise of God and you can pull out your sword and pull up your shield and say, in the name of Jesus, I decree the word of the Lord. My children are disciples taught of the Lord. Obedient to your will and great is their peace and their undisturbed composure. Oh, Father, I thank you. Psalms chapter 1, that my children will not stand in the counsel of the ungodly. My children will not be able to sit down and rest and relax where the mocker and the scornful are gathered. But my children will delight in your law and in your law they will meditate day and night and they shall become trees planted by the rivers of living water. They shall bring forth their fruit in their season and their leaf will not wither nor will it fail. Father, all my children shall be disciples taught of the Lord, obedient to your will, and great will be their peace and their undisturbed composure. And Father, I thank you for Jeremiah. I thank you for the prophet that gave me the promise so many years ago that there is hope in my future. My children shall return from the land of the enemy. They will come again into their own borders and they will receive their inheritance. You see, you can have a butter knife or you can pull out the sword. Fervent, focused, faith-filled, word-based prayer will begin to slice and dice the plans of the enemy over your family. I do not know how they did that. That was so beautiful how they had that sword like that. Is that a beautiful sword? The women's ministry gave that to me one Women's conference. Listen, prayer. It's your greatest weapon. It's your greatest tool. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for the saints. You cannot underestimate the power of your prayers. They will go forth and do things that you cannot even imagine. So mothers, get yourself a closet. Get yourself alone. Pull out your sword. Put your shield of faith up. Pull your sword out and kick some butt because that devil may be after your kids, but there's not a devil in hell or one loosed on the earth that can take them out of the hands of God. And a praying mother, a praying mother can change the very course of history for her children. Prayer. Four, love them to life. What does that mean? Love them to life. Well, Kimberly didn't live with us. Now, this saying, love people to life, has become a rock saying. But that rock revelation came from our family and came from a family that was broken and hurting. And Kim had disowned us and said it. 18 that she didn't want anything to do with us and she'd gone off into her own world in Las Vegas with her mom She lived with her mom and her her aunt and her grandma Our hearts were broken, but we continued to correspond with her and send her money on her birthday And One day she called us and she said I'm in trouble come and get me and we instantly came and went to Las Vegas and We picked him up and she was about 21 years old and she came and she lived with us and Jim had, had, from the pulpit, said, one day my daughter, Kim, because we never hid who she was or what she was into. One day my, my daughter, Kim, is going to walk these aisles. She's going to get saved. And that, that Sunday she came, and there she was at the rock, and 
Kimmy, I'm just so, so grateful that you let me share this. But there she was. She, she was skin and bones because she was meth. She was on meth. And she had a little, a little skinny, little sexy little dress on, you know, right to here. Cleavage down to here and earrings everywhere and white hair. And I just looked at her and I said, yeah, pastor's daughter, of course, you know, at The Rock. <laughs> and she got saved. And she came to live with us. And then the journey began because she hadn't lived with us and she was now an adult. And so there was times when it was very, very hard for me because I was still raising my children. Jess was five years behind her and Luke was three years behind Jess, so they were still young. And I knew that Kim was messing up and I knew she was lying and she was doing things. And her dad, Jim, my husband, was just so worried that I was going to chase her away. And there was a wedge that was starting to grow between us and our marriage. And nothing had ever come, be come between us. Nothing had ever come between us. We were a united front. It was Jim and I against the world if we had to be. And all of a sudden, his heart, because he was a dad that finally got his daughter back, his heart was so concerned that I would be too harsh on Kim that I'd chase her away. Understandable. And I didn't know what to do because I knew she was lying. I knew sometimes she was out there doing stuff she shouldn't be doing. And Jim wouldn't believe me. And one day, we, were, we actually got away and we were on a little vacation with some missionaries from... Oh my gosh, from Costa Rica. And they took us to this little third world country and we were in this little island and just, and I just was praying. I said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, I want you to love Kim to life. And it was a revelation in my heart. Love her to life, Debbie. Don't judge her to death. Love her to life. And all of a sudden God began to show me 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And God said, I want you to study this. And I want you to understand that, that love, my love, my agape, who I am, that there are things in this love is kind and it suffers long. I want you to understand what these things mean. And then I want you to come under the authority of that characteristic. If love is long suffering, then you bow your knee to long suffering and say, I come under your authority, long suffering. Love suffers long. Therefore, God, you give me the grace, the power in me to do what your truth demands of me. You give me the grace to be long suffering. Love doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. He said, child, when she does something and you know it's wrong, you bow your knee. You bow your knee and come under the authority of suffering long. And, and you bow your knee to not taking into account a wrong suffered. You bow your knee to that. What does that mean, Father? What does that mean? And he says, it means that you bow your knee like you're bowing your knee to Jesus because that's who Jesus is. And love doesn't take into account a wrong suffered child. That means love picks out a big pencil with a big eraser and it erases resentment. It doesn't even remember it. It doesn't think about what's been done. It doesn't think about the lie that's just been told. It doesn't think about all these things. It erases resentment and you come under the authority of that power. And you see, when I began to get a revelation of the love of God through Kim, I began to change and Kim began to change and our family began to change. We learn and we're learning. We're scratching the surface of how to love people to life not judge them to death. Love can fix anything. Listen, they're going to do things you don't want them to do and they're going to break your heart and sometimes they have to leave and they have to go in their own directions. But you have to trust that God's going to take care of them when they're not in your care because your prayers are covering them and you're learning to love people to life. And that's what this church does is love people to life. And you'll see people say that all over. And Kim, I just want to personally, once again, thank you for teaching me so much about the love of God in your own life, in the way you love me, and the way you love your children, and what you've gone through. I just want you to know I couldn't be prouder of you. I couldn't love you more. I'm not your natural mom, but I'm your spiritual mom. And I love you with all my heart. And I'm proud of you. So proud. Listen, love them to life. I got to stop. I've already gone too long. I can't get through this. I'm so sorry. It's 10 after 7. Love lives a lifestyle of forgiveness. We've got to relinquish the right to punish. Sometimes next week, we'll live a lifestyle. When you love somebody to life, you learn to live a lifestyle 
without blame. Gives you a brand new fresh slate. It's a clean canvas for families. But there's too much to say. I've said enough tonight. I'm gonna let it go until next week. Thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you. God took a broken family. Our children are all grown up and we've got grandchildren and they're all serving God. So there's hope. There's hope for your families. There's incredible hope for you. You know, I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know if you are sitting here tonight and your family's great or your family's not so great. I don't know if you even know what I'm talking about. But before I go any further, I want to, I want to talk to you and just give you an invitation. Because you see, Jim and I, when we got married and we brought a family together, we had been saved. We had, I'd just come back to the Lord and Jim was a Christian. And we knew what our past was in the back. We knew what it was way back there. But we didn't know what our future was going to hold, but we, we knew God was going to take care of us. And maybe you're sitting here tonight and you haven't made that decision about what you're going to do with your future and what you are going to do with God. And I have to just give you a moment to talk to you before we do anything else tonight. Jesus Christ is the real deal. He is who he says he is. He is all God and he's all man. And here we are as a Christian church living in a world that's gone absolutely crazy. Where truth is subjective, it's whatever people say it is. But you see, there. There is a truth, it's the word of God, and it's what God says it is. And when we live our lives according to God's word, and we believe what God says, then our lives get straightened out and things come into place. You know, I don't know why we think that we can just live any way we want to and we're gonna get to heaven, because bottom line, that's really what we're talking about. And this is what people don't wanna talk about is heaven, because if you go to heaven, that means you've died, and everybody is going to die in this place right now. At the sound of my voice, every one of us is going to die. And we're either going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. If I polled America, 80% of people would say, I'm going to heaven. Why are you going to heaven? Because I'm a good person. But you see, God never said you're going to heaven because you're a good person. God says there's only one way to his heaven, and it's his heaven, and it's his way. And he says you must be born again. What does that mean? It means he has a son, Jesus Christ, his only son. He knew that you and I had a problem called sin. We were born into it and we couldn't save ourselves. And he said, your goodness and my goodness and my attempt at being good is like a filthy rag in front of him because you see, it's not your standard and my standard. It's his standard. He's God. And he says, in my standard, your goodness can't measure up and get you where you want to be. There's only one way for us to get to heaven, God's heaven. We must be born again. So what does that mean? Jesus explained it very, very simply in John, the third chapter, to a man in the middle of the night that came to him and said, how do I get to heaven? And he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He said, Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. This is what that means because Nicodemus was confused. He says, what does that mean, born again? I'm an old man. I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. God is a spirit, you are a spirit, but your spirit is disconnected from God. It needs to be born again. Here's how, Nicodemus. I'm going to a cross. I'm the only one qualified to take on the sin of this world because I am all God and all man. Nicodemus, when I climb on that cross, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down and I will pick it up again. And if you'll look at that cross and if you will believe, I am who I said I am, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. If you'll look at that cross and let me be Savior and Lord, Nicodemus, you will be born again. So my question tonight is we've talked about family and children. We've seen all the way from the beginning, Adam and Eve, how they sinned, they disobeyed God, and it threw this entire planet into an upheaval. There was no way man could get back to God. There was only one way, and it was God coming to man. So God became flesh. The only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And when he went to Calvary's cross, he took on the sin of the world, your sin and my sin. And if you'll look to that cross tonight, and you'll believe he is who he says he is, and let him be your Savior and Lord, you'll be born again. What does that mean? It means you invite him. He's a gentleman. He's done all he can do. Now it's your turn to say, I need you. I need a Savior. 
You're it. I believe. God, come into my life. Come into my heart. If you have never done that, right now I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right with God. All over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've been a good person but you've never looked at that cross and committed your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, I'm talking to you. If you've backslid and you served God at one time and you're here tonight and you know you need to get right with God, I'm talking to you. I'm going to ask you in just a moment with heads up and eyes open, if you need to get right with God, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand just like that. And you're saying, but I'm going to be embarrassed. Well, oh, well, let's get over that. Let's move on, shall we? Believe me, there's a lot of reasons to be embarrassed, but there is no reason to be embarrassed about saying I'm a sinner. I need a savior and it's Jesus. Because without that, there is no salvation. Every one of us has done the same thing. And this church is a friendly place. We've prayed for you. We believe for you to come. So don't let a moment of embarrassment stop you from your destiny, your eternal destiny with Jesus Christ. So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I'm talking to you. If you've been a rascal like I was, my husband, I'm really talking to you. I'm going to count to three, then I'm going to slam this Bible like this. Boom! My husband's got a big slam. It's much louder than mine. We're going to lift our hands all together. We're going to do it all together. Are you ready? Let's get right with God tonight. One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. Raise them high so I can see you. I see that hand. 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 I see that hand in the family room. I see that hand. Over here, is everybody saved on this side of the church tonight? I don't see any hands on this side. I see that hand. So many hands going up. I see that hand. I see that hand. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to grab your, your purse, your Bible, whatever you came to church with tonight. If you just raise your hand, we're going to do this quickly. We're not done with the service. We're still going to receive offering, but this is more important than anything we've got to do right now. I'm going to ask as we stand up and we're going to sing this song. If you raised your hand or you didn't and you know you should have, I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat. I'm going to ask you to join me at this altar and let's meet the living Son of God and let's let Him be your Savior and your Lord. He is not mad at you. He is the only one that can fix you. He's the only that can save you. So come quickly, come quickly, come quickly. Let's get right with God from the family rooms. Let's just come quickly down. Run down here. Walk fast. Oh, he's such a savior. He's able to change us and save us to the uttermost. He's not angry with us. He's not mad at us. He knows us. He loves us. He made us. We are his children. And he loves us. You cannot save yourself, but you can say yes to a savior. Yes to the only savior of the world. His name is Jesus. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Oh, what a savior we have. He takes the best of humanity and he loved us so much he couldn't live without us. So he died on that cross so that you and I could live. But he didn't stay dead. He was raised from the dead and he is seated at the right hand of the Father forevermore. He is our Savior and our King. And love can fix anything. It can fix anything. So look at me and smile because you're not going to a funeral. You go into a birthday party, your birthday party. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the family of God. We're going to pray with you. We have a special room where we can privately talk to you. And this is Pastor Joel, and he's going to pray with you. And you can come right back into the service. So if you'll just make a left turn, Pastor Joel is going to pray with you. And we're going to get right with God. So we just follow Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son. 
and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.